to everyone. Uh, my name is Drew Heuser. I am a technology librarian here at the Troy Public Library. Um, and you guys are here because you're considering cutting the cord and looking into options beyond just a basic cable plan. Um, I want to, know, want to know a little bit more about how to access content without it. Uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is send in the chat here a link to a drive file. Uh, this is the PDF version of the handout that we usually pass out for this program. It looks a little something like this. It's double-sided. Um, and it is more or less just a price list um, for a lot of the more popular streaming services, streaming devices um, that we are going to be talking about today. And we put it in the handout specifically so I don't have to shove it all into the presentation. Um, and make all of that happen. One more time. Um, so the presentation itself runs 35 to 40 minutes, depending on how quickly I speak, um, which can be pretty quickly sometimes. So every minute at the end of it is going to be for um, questions to be asked from you guys to me or to each other, um, however it ends up being. So please hold any questions until the end, and then we'll put them in the chat box um, here in Zoom when we're ready to, to hit that next step. Um, so I'm going to get started. So in accessing, or in the last five years, as internet technology has advanced, uh, more and more options for accessing video content have emerged. There's a lot of growth in the area of technology right now, and things have improved dramatically even in the last year and will continue to improve. Um, I cut the cord on my cable TV, sort of. Um, technically, I've never had it. I had it at my parents' house and then through my undergraduate university. But when I got my own apartment um, six years ago now, wow, um, cable was never something that I purchased. I just purchased an internet plan and moved forward with that. Um, According to Consumer Reports, close to 800,000 subscribers dropped their traditional pay TV services um, in the first three months of 2017 alone, which is not entirely surprising considering cable customers are notoriously unhappy with the service that they get, <clears throat> and especially with the customer service that they receive. Um, and that, is, that competition is increasing every year with the larger companies. So this afternoon, we're going to provide an overview of what it means to cut the cord and help you determine if it's a strategy that's going to work for you. So during this, we're going to cover a few things. Um, I'm going to start with a quick vocab lesson on some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, we'll go into the pros and cons of why you, cut, why you might want to cut the cord. In the end, it might not be a good fit for you, and we'll cover that as well. Um, and then resources for accessing your favorite TV and, and movie content um, and overviews of some of the streaming devices. So starting off with some vocabulary, um, let me start with the word app. It's a word that's become so commonplace in today's society um, that it often sounds harder to understand than it really is. App is short for application and it refers to a software application that can be used for its one purpose. You, know, you can click on the Facebook app and it can take you all through Facebook, but it'll link you out to open any other websites. Um, in that sense, you can call Microsoft Word an app because it does its one word processing thing very well, but it can't expand beyond that. <clears throat> Um, it's different this way from a web browser like Microsoft Edge or like Chrome um, that you can use to access many different things. Uh, streaming these days generally refers to when a user watches video, digital video or audio content over the internet. Uh, with streaming content, the user does not have to download the entire video or own the entire video. Um, in order to start listening to or watching it. Uh, live streaming is a subset of this that um, refers to internet content that's being delivered in real time. Now, broadcast TV is 
television that's transmitted via radio waves um, from local television stations to an antenna. It's different from streaming in that it's not something that's delivered through the internet. Screencasting, or the shortened word for casting, um, is transmitting video or data um, displayed on a screen or computer, the screen of a computer or mobile device to a different screen, um, typically with its accompanying audio. And finally, let's cover a streaming service versus a streaming device. Uh, we're going to be using these two terms a lot throughout this uh, because they're the two pieces that are needed to really put together how to stream something. Um, you can think of it similar to a DVD and a DVD player. The streaming service is like a DVD. Um, it's the thing that you want to watch in terms of wanting to watch something on Netflix or maybe HBO. And then the streaming device is like the DVD player. You can have Netflix, you can have that DVD, but you don't have any way to watch it until you can put it in the DVD player to turn that data into something that can play on your television. So the streaming device is the physical box that connects your Netflix account, your Hulu account to your television. Um, really quickly, just because I don't think that people can see chat from before they joined, I'm going to send another cop another uh, link of the document in here. So this um, Google Drive link that's been sent to the chat box is um, a copy of the handout that's usually given out for this program, um, just so everyone can have a, a copy of it at home with them. So cutting the cord pros, and there are a few that we've got here. Uh, the first is the cost. So with a traditional cable or satellite subscription, there are high, sometimes very high, uh, monthly costs in addition to whatever initial installation fees or equipment rentals you have. Um, I know a lot of people who pay upwards of $80 to $100 a month just for cable, not even including their internet package. Um, and it's a lot of money, especially depending on your television cons consumption habits. It might not be something that you use enough to justify the price. Uh, when you cut the cord, the largest cost is usually right up front when you make sure you have all of the, the equipment necessary. Um, but then your monthly payments can end up being significantly lower um, and giving you the same amount of television freedom that you wanted before. Uh, the next is flexibility. When you have a traditional cable or satellite package, you, get, you mostly get that service at your one location. You route it to your home and you can only access your uh, recordings or your live television there while you're in your home. Um, with any of the streaming devices and streaming services, um, that's not rooted at all. You can access your content that you're paying for, um, moving it room to room, taking the box with you up north on vacation, signing into your account at a friend's house, anything that can be done as long as there's working internet in the place you want to watch your device, your um, content, you can. Uh, the next is consumer power. As the old saying goes, money talks. Uh, the penetration rate of pay TV services has decreased every year for the past four years, while the percentage of cord cutters has been increasing. There's even a growing percentage of cord nevers, like myself, um, consumers who have never had pay TV service that they personally pay for. Uh, because there is consumer demand, enterprising companies are rising to meet it, uh, creating flexible, affordable products that give pay TV services a run for their money. And all of this competition has forced telecom companies to be a lot more attractive, to make a lot more attractive bundling and pricing for their customers and really package all of their things together. So you have to take an all or nothing approach. Um, so even if you choose not to cut the cord, um, even if you choose not to cut the cord, the, tre the trend could still benefit you in providing more better packaging options for your services down the line. 
Um, it also forces content developers to invest in high quality in demand content that people really want in order to get them to buy into their streaming service, maybe over any of the others. Um, if people have decided to download Netflix just to watch Stranger Things or Orange is the New Black, or maybe gotten Hulu just to watch uh, Handmaid's Tale, you'll know a little what I'm saying here. Um, and then the last one is a la carte. Um, if you can get, if you get hundreds of channels at home through your cable service, chances are you'll find yourself maybe watching four or five of them regularly um, with a couple more thrown in along the way. Um, you, you could ever ask yourself if you can just get HBO, if you can just get ESPN. Um, in a future where that sort of service where you pay directly for the channels you're interested in may not be too far off. Um, only a few years ago, a standalone streaming service from HBO was something that they said they would never go for. And they've just launched a new one to replace their old streaming service, um, showing that the consumers really want this from them and are asking them to, provi to provide it. Now, of course, it is not all sunshine and roses. Um, cutting the cord is not something that's going to work for everyone. And we want to approach this as though you're really making this decision. We're not here to say, you're here to cut the cord. This is what you want to do. Cutting the cord doesn't work for everyone. And if you end up being one of those people, then I hope you'll at least leave today a little more um, secure in your decision to stay with your pay TV service. So the first con that we have listed here is the initial setup. Uh, for some, the, the investment in the initial setup, both from a cost and technology perspective, is too much. If you're not ready to commit to cutting the cord, the initial purchase of some of the technology to stream from home um, can be a lot. Um, if it could be that the technology is more than you want to spend or more than you're comfortable using. Um, if you find technology to be intimidating or stressful, this really might not be for you. Uh, the second is that internet is required um, for all but the most basic option of your TV with an antenna attached. Um, you will still have to pay for high speed internet service, which you're most likely getting from whatever company you were already getting your TV service through. Um, due to all of the bundling options that Xfinity, AT&T, WOW offer, uh, standalone internet service may be something that tends to be more expensive in your area if you want to purchase it alone uh, and it may not really be worth it um, but if pay tv subscriptions continue to decline the telecoms will probably make up for that loss of revenue by increasing the price of standalone internet service um, if you already consider the internet a must-have no matter where you fall on this then this isn't going to sound uh, problematic to you but if you were one of the people hoping that you could come in here and leave it at 2 p.m. and rip up your cable bill and never think about it again, um, then cutting the cord probably won't work in the way that you want it to work. Uh, the third thing here is less diverse programming. And this is the other side of the, um, the Consumer Power Pro. Um, if anyone listens to the NPR program, Planet Money, they have a segment a while back about how cord cutting is forcing pay TV providers to reduce their channel lineups. Um, if there is an obscure TV channel or maybe a really obscure program that you love as a consumer, there are a couple of things that could happen here. Uh, first, if you do decide to cut the cord, you may lose access to it. Um, with the more obscure channels and programs, there isn't always a way to stream these, these selections. Um, if a channel doesn't have its own streaming service and if it's not seen as wide enough appeal for, for a place like Amazon or Netflix or Hulu to purchase the streaming rights, it may be something that only exists through a cable provider. The next thing that might happen is that it could get cut from the cable lineup entirely if more and more people who did watch it 
switch over to streaming service and they lose the viewership that they were getting by on. Um, there's also less opportunity for just stumbling across new content by channel surfing without pay TV service. So if that's how you love to explore new shows, it's something to consider. And the last con on here might look a little familiar. Um, it is the same a la carte con as pro. And we put it under both sections because it can be a double-edged sword. There are a lot of amazing streaming services out there. Um, I think in my life I have access to seven or eight of them that all put out fantastic content. Um, and with so many having original programming, it can be hard to feel like you're not missing out if you don't subscribe to multiple services. If you find yourself packaging together four or more of these streaming services, um, it may start to approach the cost of what you were paying in your cable subscription and be less convenient in the process. Uh, there's the old adage of measuring twice and cutting once. So you want to look into your options and really figure out all of the things that you need to be a satisfied television consumer and then see what that would cost from a um, streaming services set of platforms. Uh, there was a patron who came to one of these programs, I think two years ago, who came back and said that what they did was they put a notebook next to their couch for a week and they wrote down every channel and every video or every television show that they watched. And then that's what they did the research based on. They found the ways to find those specific programs that they didn't want to miss. And in the end, it was the correct option to cut the cord for them. They, and it, they went ahead and did it. And I can only assume are living their best television consumer lives. Um, but it's not, it, it's, it's not something that you should go into blind, assuming this is the better option. Um, it's definitely something that you need to put in the research on. So now let's talk about how to access all of your favorite content um, without cable TV. You know, first and foremost, the library. This is a library service and you have access to a fantastic library here. Um, we have a huge connection, collection of DVD movies, Blu-rays, and TV shows. If there's not something on the shelf, then you can place a hold on it for as, hold for it as long as you have a Troy Public Library card, which I think everyone in here does. Um, if there actually is a limit to how many items you can check out at once, I've never seen anyone hit it. And we do our absolute best to stay current with new DVDs and TV shows that are coming out for series. Uh, keep in mind that not all original programming that goes on streaming services becomes available on DVD. So that's also something to consider. Um, if there's something you'd like to see the library look into purchasing that we don't already have, you can always contact the library reference desk and we can look into, apply, look into acquiring it. Uh, the next is Hoopla. Hoopla is one of our library streaming services um, that we offer for free to all library patrons. So, by being here today, you already have a way to set up accounts for these. Uh, Hoopla is one of the library's digital resources and with it streams movies and TV shows, as well as having access to music, audiobooks, ebooks, and comics uh, through your computer or through the Hoopla digital app. Uh, Troy Public Library patrons can use Hoopla for free and use up to five items per month. There are some fantastic movies that are on here available to watch instantly. Uh, there are no holds or waiting periods. As soon as you want it, it's yours. And new content is added every week. Uh, you may be wondering, how can I access movies and television from Hoopla on your TV? Uh, there are a few ways to access Hoopla. Um, depending on the streaming device that you have, um, you might be able to find the Hoopla app on in your um, app store. I know that Roku has it. I am pretty sure that Apple TV has it. Um, those are the two that I'm pretty sure on, but there, there are probably others that do by now. Um, you can also just do what I call the broke college student method of taking an HDMI cable and hooking it directly from your computer up to your television. 
Uh, Canopy is another streaming service that we offer through the library. Uh, Canopy was originally developed for academic libraries as a hub for documentaries, but it's expanded in recent years to include popular films um, and film production companies, ranging from classic Paramount Picture films up to current breakout um, A24 studio films like The Farewell or Moonlight. Um, as with Hoopla, TPL cardholders can set up an account for free and can check out up to um, five movies per calendar month. Canopy also has an amazing partnership with the Great Courses collection of lectures and educational materials, where you can watch those materials from their entire collection without using one of your allotted five views. Uh, Canopy also has a streaming app, which depending on, depending on your device may or may not be available. Now, on-demand streaming services. There are a ton of streaming services out there right now, and new ones are being added every day. Um, Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime Video are the most popular, but with an infusion of new content, new services like Disney+, Plus, Apple TV, um, and HBO Max are quickly rising through the ranks as well. These providers offer on-demand content, which means it's available at all times. Uh, there are no sites that provide a full listing of what any of the streaming services may or may not be offering, but almost all of them do offer a seven-day free pass as a demo of sorts to give you a chance to see if there's enough content that you'd be interested in purchasing month to month. Um, because all of these are month to month, you also have the option of, pur of purchasing into it for the length of time that you want it and then canceling your subscription. There's no two-year contract that you're locked into with this huge cancellation fee. Um, all of them have month to month and canceling them is no problem. I just canceled an HBO subscription because I now have access to HBO Max and it was one button press through my Amazon to cancel it. It was the easiest thing in the book. Uh, places like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon are constantly making new agreements with different networks and production companies. So the content can change quite a bit on a regular basis. Uh, for example, just two weeks ago, the TV show Parks and, Recre Parks and Recreation um, was removed from all three of those main streaming services so that NBC can use it as a selling point for their new streaming service, which they're calling Peacock TV. I'm still devastated about this and mourning in my own way. Um, but it is doing the job of making Peacock TV more attractive to a consumer like me. And finally, live TV streaming services. Um, in addition to all of the on-demand streaming services available, there are also now internet TV providers who offer live TV that you stream over the internet. Uh, these are the ones that I've heard most about, these four. Um, but there are others out there and more popping up all the time. Um, Hulu live streaming debuted at the end of 2017. Um, I believe it is currently $44.99 a month. That feels right. Yes. Um, and the biggest reason I found to recommend it is that it offers live local channels in addition to um, some of the larger AMCs, Comedy Central's that um, that they offer. Um, I've even been told it offers Fox Sports Detroit for all of the, uh, the sports fans looking into this and worried about how they're going to still get their content. Um, uh, YouTube TV is another new internet TV service. It is $40 a month and offers a lot of the same channels. Um, with that, YouTube infrastructure that people have gotten to know pretty well over the last uh, 15 years. Now, PlayStation View has been around for a while, but from what I understand, it was only available through PlayStation devices and has very recently expanded its access point, so you no longer need a PlayStation console to view it. Um, it starts at $44.99 with the popular live TV package and has different packages that range similar to a cable, cable TV purchase based on 
the type of content that you want access to and how much of it you want. Um, if you're interested in any of these and want to learn what sort of channels are, are available, um, on the handout that was sent out, um, have all of the websites to get to their base programs to see what sort of channels they have access to. So depending on what channels and shows are your favorites, you can investigate a way to access them without a cable or a satellite subscription. Now, the last thing on here is antennas. Broadcast TV is still available um, and oftentimes comes with a better um, picture quality than cable because they don't have to compress it to send it. Um, in our zip code under, I'm putting up the air quotes, optimal weather conditions and optimal antenna placement, uh, you can receive up to 38 channels with an indoor antenna or up to 52 channels with an outdoor antenna. Um, antenna technology has come a long way and there are a lot of over the air digital HD channels that you can access with a good HD an antenna. Uh, there are probably even some oddball channels that you don't get through cable service and would never show up on a streaming service that you can get with an antenna. Unfortunately, Consumer Reports does not have ratings for TV antennas, but Crutchfield, a premier retailer of audio and video technology and equipment, has a great article on, this, on uh, their website that we have linked on page two of the handout. Now let's get into a little bit more of streaming devices. So like we were talking about before, um, these are the boxes that are required to turn your subscriptions and streaming services into something that you can play on your television. Now there are two different kinds of cord cutters. My dad is a cord cutter. Um, all he has is an antenna and a TV, excuse me. <clears throat> um, he uses his phone for any, used his phone for any internet service that he needed. Um, until coronavirus lockdown started, he didn't pay for internet. He does now, um, but he doesn't have any of these fancy gadgets. Um, he is perfectly happy with his sports games that air on CBS and his Judge Judy, and he's making it through. Uh, my mom finally put her foot down a couple of months ago now that they have internet and forced me to bring over what was needed to let her watch Hamilton um, on Disney+. Plus but that's that's all that's been allowed in their household. Um, I'm a different kind of cable cutter. Um, I have internet, I pay for Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus, and I have something that lets me um, stream those services onto my television. So unless all you plan on is watch, plan on watching is live TV on network television with a TV and antenna just like my dad, uh, you will need some kind of special equipment in order to, to access the content you love without a cable subscription. There are a lot of devices and we do not have time to talk about all of them. Um, so what we pulled here is the four most popular um, as rated by Consumer Reports um, and then a couple of extra oddball options. Um, so all of those decisions can be made. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that this is not meant to be a promotion for any of the devices um, that we talk about today or that are out there. Uh, the purpose is to let you know the range of options that exist and then those decisions in terms of what works for you has to be made on a more individual level once you've taken your needs into consideration. So Roku has released several generations of their streaming player, uh, the most recent being the Roku Ultra. They also have a small streaming stick that plugs directly into the HDMI port of your TV. Um, Roku is consistently the top rated streaming service by Consumer Reports or streaming player, sorry, um, because of its because of lack of affiliation with Apple and Amazon and Google gives it a lot of flexibility in what it's able to offer and for the prices. Um, now, Amazon Fire TV is Amazon's answer to the streaming player. Uh, it's a small compact device that comes with a remote control and can also come with a game controller to play games on it. Um, Amazon Fire TV is 
pretty consistently the second rated or second best rated streaming player. Um, it's about a hundred dollars, but you can get really good deals from Amazon with it, especially today because I think it is Amazon Prime Day. Um, they also make a Fire TV stick uh, that functions a lot like the player. The main difference between the sticks and the boxes for both this and Roku on the previous slide um, is the amount of memory that it can store. So it uh, the boxes will have a slightly better <coughs> slightly better downloading speed and bandwidth and we'll be able to support more apps at once um, so if you plan on using it a lot you might want to go for the larger box if you just want the occasional netflix the stick will be more than enough for you um, amazon as well as apple the next one that we're going to talk about has a lot of interconnectability with their devices um, if you're someone that uses prime a lot already um, if you have an Amazon Echo in your home, Amazon may be the way for you to go because there's a lot of um, crossplay that you can do with those to, you know, speak to the Amazon Echo to tell it to watch a show on the Amazon Fire TV. Um, it's a really cool connection that smart homes can have. Um, it may be something that's not something you'd be interested in, but it is it is there. Um, Apple TV is very similar. They were the first major tele technology company to get serious about developing a user-friendly video streaming device. Uh, the original Apple TV was released in 2007, yes. And the fourth generation that was, was released in September 2015. I think that's the most current still. Um, depending on what memory options you choose, um, the device is the most expensive that we have on the list today. No surprise because it's an Apple product. Um, it carries a very strong rating for consumer reports, but still falls behind Roku and occasionally behind Amazon um, because of the price and compatibility options. Because Apple and Amazon compete with each other for the sale of digital audio and video content, there is no um, Amazon Prime video app on the Apple TV, and similarly, there's no iTunes app on the Amazon Fire TV. Now, one thing that Apple is fantastic at is making sure that everything they have is interconnected. So if you're a family that has iPads, iPhones, MacBook computers, if you already do purchasing through iTunes, this very well may be the device for you because everything has built-in compatibility and it's very convenient. The last is Google. Um, Google has a couple of options, the Chromecast and the Nexus Player. Uh, Chromecast is not technically a streaming device in that it cannot save streaming service apps to itself. Um, it is an easy way to facilitate Chrome, um, screencasting onto your television. So you would need another working device, a computer or a smartphone to project um, what you want to play onto the TV. But it is incredibly cheap for what it does and does its job very well. Um, if you're looking to not entirely cut your cable, but defray the costs a little, then the Google Chromecast is a fantastic thing for places like having a second um, cable box in your bedroom or other rooms of the TV. You can have the cable going to your main television and then Chromecast for when you're in the other rooms. Uh, Google does also make its own streaming device called the Nexus Player. Um, it is one of the only streaming devices I've never used or seen in the wild. Um, it's usually rated slightly below Apple TV um, because of complaints about the connectivity. Now, smart TVs are a thing that have become a lot more prevalent um, in the last few years. Uh, smart TVs are HD TVs that are actually smart. That, mean, that means they can connect to the internet and use apps to access video, audio, and web content. Um, it's important when you select a smart TV to look into the options and gauge how smart um, they are. Some smart TVs will have a preset number of um, streaming channels that you can access. So it'll come pre-installed with Netflix, 
Facebook, Pandora, and Hulu. And you can watch all of those, but you can't add new streaming services to the listing. Um, some of them will have their own app stores and give you a lot more um, customizable and wider range of options for apps. Um, there are even TVs out there now with a built-in Roku or Apple infrastructure that make it really easy to get a new TV and the latest streaming device without needing to add an extra box. Um, and the last thing, just something to consider because a lot of homes already have gaming systems, uh, PlayStations and Xboxes for a number of years now um, can access streaming content as well. Um, it's very similar to a smart TV in that it may have a limited range of things that it can access or it can give you access to a full store. Um, so that'll be something to look into if you have any gaming devices or if you are already planning on getting something um, that it may be able to double its use to give you both the games that you're interested in and any sort of streaming content. So that is everything. Um, in the end, you just have to evaluate the pros and cons between keeping your cable service and cutting the cord and going into the great beyond of what exists. Um, if cutting the cord is for you, then you'll put together the free content from the library and free antenna channels, along with paid content like Hulu and Netflix. Choose the best device for you and you're all good to go. So that is the end of the prepared content that I have. Um, took about 37 minutes, so I'm right in the ball there. So um, we can now open everything up to questions. So if anyone has any questions um, about any point in the presentation, feel free to type them into the chat box um, so that we can go forward with answering them. Um, if you need to know where the chat box is, then on the lower bar of the Zoom call. There will be a few options there. It's where you mute and unmute, you, unmute your mic or your video. It's where you'll leave the call um, when we're done. And one of the buttons on there is chat. So the first um, question asked is, what internet speed would you need, um, assuming that you have other users using the same? So the standard um, answer from the industry is 25 megabits per second per active user. So if you think that you're going to have a streaming service and, I don't know, two laptops on the internet at once, um, then you, you'll probably be looking in the range of 75. Um, if you're a solo user, you can probably go down to 50 or even 25, uh, depending on how much you, you see yourself using it but to get the the buffer right for it. Um, 25 megabits per second per active user is what they recommend. I don't know. Um, next question was, can Hoopla or Canopy be accessed through the Amazon Fire Stick? <clears throat> and that is one that I don't know if it's made it into Amazon stores. Um, I know it has through Roku. I have a Roku TV at home and I can access Hoopla and Canopy just fine, but I've never tried it with an Amazon Fire Stick. Uh, so that'll be something to look into um, if you're looking to purchase an Amazon Fire Stick um, as to whether or not that's a channel that they have access to. Are there any questions out there? Okay, um, and we will call that good and get you all out of here a little early. Um, oh, okay. So um, I have an older TV. I have seen that you can use an RGA to HDMI converter cable to turn it. Um, by that, if you mean um, to hook up devices to it, that is what the cable is there for. Um, 
whether it works on any individual any individual TV is, you know, something that you'll have to purchase and test out. Um, but that is what the device is there for. And then once it's converted to HDMI, then um, then it can be accessed. Um, with Hulu and local channel access, does that include the PBS station? Um, that I believe can be accessed through um, through Hulu. I want to say that it's listed as a local channel um, that Hulu would have access to. So I believe the answer is yes. I know the answer is yes with um, with antenna. So there is a question of if it's possible for anyone to help one on one. Um, at the end of this, I'm going to put my um, my email address at the library into the chat um, so that you can take it down. My email address is also on the handout uh, that we sent out at the start, and I'll post that link again really quickly in case anyone joined since the last time. Um, so you can feel free to email me, and we can try and go into a little more detail. Um, I, if I don't have cable, but do have antenna, um, do I have scan channels such as MeTV, Buzzer, or PBS? Um, MeTV and Buzzer, I believe, are antenna channels. I've never looked into whether or not they um, have streaming options. So you would look into your, um, your options, either Hulu Live TV or searching them on the internet to see if they offer a streaming version with, with any channel that you're looking for. Um, the first step is to go to their website and see if they list places to stream it. Um, more often than not, they'll have their own, CBS has their own, Fox does, um, NBC is just coming out with their own Peacock TV. So when you go to the website, they want you to watch their content. So if it's available streaming anywhere, they're going to give you the way. Um, but that, that falls under the, the individual um, setup for it. Um, if you have something like Roku and an antenna, do you end up with multiple remotes? Yes, you will. Um, Roku has a lot of things going for it. And one thing that it does not do well is allow its service to be used with, say, a universal remote. Um, Roku does have a mobile app. And on the mobile app, one of the options is to turn it into a remote um, to use with a device that's using Roku um, that's on the same internet connection as it. So you do have the option, if you go with Roku, of um, using the app as the remote when you want to watch it. And then you don't need to have another remote in the home. Um, but if you're using both the Roku and the antenna TV enough that you don't want to go that route, it would be a couple of different remotes, yes. Yeah. All right, so this is my email address at the library. Again, my name is Drew, and I'm one of the technology librarians. Uh, we do have a couple of other technology programs coming up. Um, a week and a half from now, we'll have our um, job search program with Natalie. I believe that's on the 22nd uh, from 1 to 2.30. And then in uh, November, I will, be, I will be back doing a, um, a Google program. So what can your Google account do for you? Uh, we'll go into Docs, Forms, um, links to your YouTube account, all of those things. Um, so yeah, I hope to see everyone back. And thank you all for coming.